So uh, thank you very much indeed for letting me be part of this. This is only my second challenger, and I have to say I'm fully persuaded to come every time from now on. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about coccolithophores. Um, uh, I, I suspect this is a, a bug that many of you may be aware of. Um, and I want to show you initially the importance of them to the Earth system, and then I guess try and burrow into a question which I've been tackling for a few years, which is trying to understand how they may be affected by the anthropogenic rise in carbon dioxide. So the coccolithophores, these single-celled uh, photosynthesizing phytoplankton, uh, and they make these wonderfully intricate calcium carbonate platelets on this one here, Emiliani Huxi is a really tiny cell. It's only about five microns in diameter. But as I've said, they can have an enormous influence on the Earth system as is captured by this satellite image of a, of a coccolithophore bloom. Oh. So um, you can also see these huge accumulations of them from back in the Cretaceous time in the White Cliffs of Dover. And many people, I, th I think, particularly in Southampton, are trying to work out how much calcite might be accumulating and might be being produced at, uh, by coccolithophores. And I just tried to have a go at a back-of-the-envelope calculation, and I figured out if they're accumulating at a rate of about 0.75 billion tonnes per year, what does that equate to in terms of the number of lifts that these guys are producing? And it turns out to be 6 times 10 to the 25 lifts per year, roughly. So that's about 100 times Avogadro's number for those chemists amongst you. So they're pre creating an enormous number of lifts uh, in the ocean. And this is essentially the end of the weathering process on the planet. So we're dissolving the continental material. Um, this calcium silicate is dissolving in the weak carbonic acid of carbon dioxide, with carbon dioxide here. Sorry, I don't know if you can see that. Um, and generating the ingredients for that calcium carbonate and the silica. And this is the long-term geological store of the ingredients from that weathering that goes into sediments which can then be preserved perhaps on land or alternatively go down subduction zones and return their carbon via volcanoes to the atmosphere. And this has termed the Earth's long-term thermostat, whereby the CO2 is reacting with those rocks on the continents, creating calcium carbonate and drawing down that CO2. So if there's any perturbation in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that elevates the rate. It raises the temperature of the planet and that speeds up this reaction and generates more ingredients for calcium carbonate production. So this is part of where the coccolithophores play a major role in the Earth's system. The additional role that they play is also in stabilising the, the, this outer part of the planet in terms of the ocean and the atmosphere. So they generate the calcium carbonate, courtesy of these ingredients coming in from weathering, but that calcium carbonate rains down into the deep ocean and we have these deep sea sediments. And there's a boundary above which the oceans are saturated and beneath which the oceans are undersaturated with respect to calcium carbonate. And essentially, perturbations to the carbon dioxide system up here also allow this boundary to shift up and down, dissolving and preserving uh, calcium carbonate. And this acts to buffer the system again against perturbations of carbon dioxide. So really, the coccolithophores are kind of the stabilizers on the Earth's surface, on the pH of the ocean, and on the alkalinity of the ocean. So this, they really provide this long-term geological stability to the, to the carbon system. And when did they start to do this? When did they really start to generate the calcium carbonate? Well, in fact, amongst this is a, a, a phylogenetic tree of the haptophytes um, showing the kind of evolution of the different cells and the different lineages within the haptophytes. So the pavlovales, a very ancient lineage coming through. And what I want to point out, because this will become important later on, is that there are two lineages of cells which create calcium carbonate. The coccolithales, which are really sort of the true coccolithophores, and Emiliani Huxley actually falls into this group, the isochrysidales, and many of this group are naked and don't actually produce calcium carbonate, uh, but Emiliani Huxley and the gyrophyrocapsids, the reticulofenestrids, do create calcium carbonate, and they come from this lineage. And they evolved around the Triassic or the Jurassic. We've got this first fossil heterococcolith about 220 million years ago. And so it's really at this time that they would have this major impact in stabilizing uh, the, the carbon system of the Earth's surface. 
And since that time of evolution, they've had to go on a bit of a roller coaster, essentially. They require carbon for their, both photosynthesis and for calcification. So they've got this dual requirement for carbon. And yet they've been living in an environment which, partly because of their success, has become increasingly diminishing in the availability of that carbon. So the coccolithophores evolved back here, and they've had to ride through this period of time where the CO2 has plummeted from up around 1,000, maybe even 2,000 ppm back here to levels around 200, 300 ppm going through these Pleistocene glacial cycles and up to the modern day. So they've gone down this incredible slope of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Um, here's my coccolithophore here riding down this roller coaster, trucked along a bit at these very low levels. And now they're facing this, this challenge of, of the rising atmospheric carbon dioxide. And there are many uh, publications out there which, which hail that this is a real worry for the coccolithophores, that this rising CO2 will lower the pH of the oceans and they will lose this ability to calcify. And so they could, we could lose them as part of this uh, ecosystem. And that's the question that I really want to try and tackle in this talk, is what can we learn about the adaptation of these cells to this declining CO2 that may help us to understand and predict their future in this rising CO2 world? And so as CO2 declined, there are, there are many things that a cell could do to try and help uh, boost its internal carbon dioxide. So one thing it could do is to adapt the enzymes, and I'm going to show you some data from Rubisco about how it has adapted to this change in atmospheric carbon dioxide to the decline in availability of the carbon dioxide. So the cells can similarly evolve mechanisms where they can boost the amount of carbon dioxide inside the cell. So these are what's called carbon concentrating mechanisms. The other thing they can do is they can get small, of course, to increase the surface area to volume ratio. So they can increase that, that ratio and thereby keep their sort of internal pool of carbon full as opposed to here where it's starting to become depleted. And the alternative thing they could do is, is become marginalised. If they just can't keep up with this declining CO2, they may lose their competitive success and end up being marginalised in, in, in just specific locations where CO2 is still highly available, things like upwelling or the polar regions. So we started this, this story of trying to understand how the coccolithophores have adapted in the past. I wanted to ideally look at calcification. In the end, that's the process that I was kind of key to, to understanding. But we know very little about the genes or the enzymes that are specifically involved in that. So I started to think about photosynthesis. This is the other thing that the, the coccolithophores are doing. And Rubisco lies at the heart of that. This is the enzyme that catalyzes all photosynthesis in the plants, in the algae, everything that is, is, is producing oxygen. And this is a classically inefficient enzyme because it, it binds carbon dioxide, but oxygen is a very competitive substrate. It's very good at outcompeting carbon dioxide for the active site. And so Rubisco is classically a very inefficient enzyme. And many people have thought that perhaps it evolves through time as, as carbon dioxide levels have dropped and oxygen levels have risen, that Rubisco could have perhaps become a little bit more efficient at telling the difference between these two competing substrates. And some measure of that is efficiency, but I'll, I'll go through some other measures that we've managed to do. And the process, that, or the, the technique that we were going to try and use was this adaptive evolution, where we're looking at the gene sequence for Rubisco, we're looking at both the large subunit and the small subunit. I'll show you in a second how the, the molecule is arranged. And we were really trying to look at the rates of genetic mutation um, relative, uh, where the mutation leads to a change in the protein relative to the rates of what we call silent mutation. And so here um, is a silent mutation. You can see a mutation here in the codon from an A to a G, which has no change in the encoded amino acid. So there's this ambiguity in the, in the genetic code, which means that mutations can happen without any change in the, in the protein, or you can have a mutation here from a UUA or a UUG to an AUG, and you do get a change in the protein. And we can look at these relative rates, the silent mutations, relative to those that uh, give a change in the protein. And if the rate of that is greater than one, then it tells us that there's an adaptation which has proliferated through the tree and given success to the lineage. 
So here we've looked at the haptophytes, the haptophyte tree, and this is a Rubisco molecule where you have these incredible units of the eight units of the large subunit and eight of the small subunit. And we've been able to, to plot adaptive events on this phylogenetic tree. And I've just highlighted here the pavlovales at the bottom. I only ever remember them because I think of the pavlova. Um, and uh, so this is, this is the rather ancient lineage, which doesn't calcify at all. And we go up through, we've got the phaocystis here, coming into Emiliani huxii. This is the isochrysodales here. And up to, this is pleurochrys, it's a rather coastal coccolithophore up here. And the events that really sprung out, I've, I've highlighted some in light blue here, and that's where some of the sites are under selection, but where we have a whole bright, a whole um, uh, 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 branch being under positive selection, I've highlighted that here in the bright red, so we have a major positive selection event between the pavlovales and essentially the primnesiales. Um, and then we also have a very strong positive selection event coming up towards Emiliani Huxley and Jophira Capsa Oceanica. The different colour here tells me that this is in, in the small subunit of Rubisco and this positive selection event is in the large subunit of Rubisco. And we can see there are other sort of um, subtle adaptive changes, but they're not as statistically significant as these big ones. So the question was, well, how is... So that tells us that Rubisco has adapted, but what, how... Uh, but, but what's actually happening to the chemistry of that Rubisco? Is it improving in its ability uh, uh, to distinguish between these substrates? And so we, we extracted the Rubisco and tried to measure its michaelis menten kinetics. Now, I've got a little... This was something to try and wake you up in, in the morning, a little sort of quiz. Um, we'll see if, if we can get this to work. I don't know how many of you are very familiar with michaelis menten kinetics, but essentially, you have a reaction velocity and you have a substrate concentration. And as you increase the substrate concentration, that's for your enzyme, or as I'll show you a bit later, this can be substituted for a cell. As you increase that substrate concentration, the reaction velocity goes up. And that sort of makes, makes sense. You've got more of the stuff you're going to react, so the reaction rate goes up. But then this tends towards some kind of what we call Vmax. That's the maximum turnover rate of the enzyme, where the enzyme is essentially saturated. And when we talk about affinities of enzymes for a substrate, the term that is often used is this Km. And this is the value, this is the concentration of the substrate that's required to get to half of the maximum velocity. And so if you have a, a Km which is low, that actually implies you've got a very high affinity for your substrate. And if you've got a Km which is very high, that implies that you've got a low affinity for your substrate. It requires a lot of that substrate to get anywhere close to your half maximal velocity. So, I hope I've explained that. Let's just see. Uh, this is going to date me. I grew up with Bruce Forsyth and uh, play your cards right. And this was a, a, a quiz game for those of you who are very young in here. Um, where it was extraordinarily exciting. He turned over cards. And here you've got a seven, and you had to guess whether the next card was higher or lower than a seven. So, can we translate this to the Km of enzymes? <laughs> right. <laughs> the enzyme of cell A has a Km of 10 micromoles per CO2. So, you need 10 micromoles of CO2 to get to your half Vmax. Enzyme of cell B has a Km of 50 micromoles per kilogram of CO2. So, does enzyme of cell A have a higher or lower affinity for CO2? Who's going to vote for higher? Oh, yes. OK, very good. I, I, uh, you're very bright, or I at least managed to ex explain it. So wonderful, yes. <laughs> it was higher. <laughs> I think there was always rapturous applause in Bruce Forsyth, so I, I, I had to look that up. Right, OK. So, let's see if I can get my trail of thought back. That was that's the first time I tried that experiment in a talk, we'll see. Um, so, we've measured the KMs of the Rubiscos from these different cells going across these adaptive events. If you remember, there was a big adaptive event between the Pavlovales and everybody else, and then we had this wonderful adaptive event going towards Emiliani Huxii and Shafira Capsa. And I've essentially just drawn those along the way. So this is almost evolving through time. And so you can see the Pavlovales, this is a, a Kc value, which is in the, in the coloured bars here. And we also actually measured the, the Ko values, and those are in the dotted bars. So that's the affinity for oxygen, the sort of competitive substrate. 
And what's interesting is between the Pavlovales and everybody else, we've got that major selection event. We see very little evidence of change in the KC, actually, uh, sort of immediately across that event. And the big change happens to be in KO. So we get this big jump in, in the affinity for oxygen. And, and if I was giving a different talk, I would explore that a little bit more. But what's, what's interesting, at least here, is that as we go towards Emiliani Huxleyi, we see that the KC is getting very much higher. And so what that means is that the, the Rubisco is getting a lower affinity for carbon dioxide through time. And that's sort of counterintuitive. If you think your substrate is in, diminishing in the environment, this is telling me that my Rubisco is getting less and less good at binding. And this is actually a, 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 a sort of curious thing. And what it probably means is that Emiliani Huxley and Jafira Caps are being very good at concentrating carbon around their Rubisco. So they're able to adapt through this decline in the environment to actually boost the amount of carbon dioxide that they've got inside the cell. And as I show you, there are a couple of ways that they're doing that. But the real winner here is the fact that actually there's a trade-off between how strongly you bind to your substrate and how quickly you can turn over in Rubisco. So here in the, in the plants and in the red algae, if you're very good at binding to carbon dioxide, it makes you really slow. But if you've got a lower affinity for the carbon dioxide, you can turn over that much faster. And this seems to be the evolutionary edge that uh, Emiliani Huxley is really getting. If they're able to concentrate that carbon dioxide, they can turn over that enzyme much faster. And indeed, what we, what we find, I, I won't bore you too much with the details here, but is that across this event, this initial event of adaptation, we see a big change in the actual cellular structure, whereby the rubisco is getting packaged into this thing called a pyranoid, and then there are changes towards immersed pyranoid. But this is thought to be part of a CCM. It's a compartment where the cells are able to control the chemistry around the rubisco. And we also see the emergence of a particular delta carbonic anhydrase. This is part of a CCM which we see absent in these pavlovales. So it's clear that through these adaptive events, we've got some kind of CCM evolving where the, the, the cells are more able to concentrate carbon. But the other thing that is very specific about Emiliani Huxley, uh, particularly relative to the coccolithales, is that it has become smaller. And as I've mentioned, we've got the coccolithales, which are really big, and the Emiliani huxii, which are very small. And it's hard at the moment. We think Emiliani huxii has some element of CCM, but one of its big competitive edges is that it has become very, very small and it really able to, to get this great surface area to volume ratio. So the prediction here is that the coccolithales are large and that they're going to change the, the size of their internal pool Whereas over time, as you've got this declining CO2, whereas Emiliani Huxley has become smaller. I sort of realised I should have had this, this slide a little bit earlier, but this is just a, a measure of the, the coccolith size of, of the coccolith ales through time going back 60 million years, and they've really stayed pretty constant. So they've been large, they've stayed large, but the, the, the payment that they've had to make for that is that their internal pool has become half full or half empty, depending on whether they're optimistic or pessimistic coccolith ales. On the, on the flip side of that, the, the Emiliani Huxley coming out of that isochrysidale lineage has actually changed its size very much through time. It's really diminished hand in hand. This is looking at a particular part, the Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene, but there are some longer records now which really show this change in the size and they've diminished over time and, and indeed this is kind of part of the reason why it's so hard to do geochemistry on them. So these two lineages have got very different controls on their carbon acquisition and the coccolith ales in, in a sense have been left behind by Emiliani Huxley. We know from looking at their biogeography today they were, the, they were the weed of the ocean back in the, in the paleogene, but now they're very much marginalised. And this is because they've got this half-full internal pool. They're essentially utilising the majority of the carbon that they've got available to them, whereas Emiliani Huxley has got a really full one and it can function very quickly. And this actually plays out rather nicely in the isotopes. I, I, I hesitated as to whether to bring in isotopes to this, but we see this big difference uh, between whether the coccoliths actually preserve equilibrium isotopes or an equilibrium with their environment or have what's called a very big vital effect, which is offset from equilibrium. 
And what we find is that uh, if you grow different bugs, so this is looking at Coccolithus browrudii, so the large bug versus a smaller one, Jafira capsa oceanica, in different amounts of CO2, then you get differential offsets. So the small bug essentially trucks along almost at equilibrium, whereas the large bug is very much <coughs> offset to light values at low CO2. So those of you who are geochemists, if there are any, uh, in the crowd, this is a wonderful new proxy for being able to uh, look into atmospheric CO2 in the past, looking at the offset in the isotopes between the large coccolithophores and the small coccolithophores. And we've actually been able to, this was something that we found out in culture and through a, a wonderful graduate student of mine, Harry McClelland, um, he's uh, been putting this into a model essentially with different compartments where you're driving Rayleigh fractionation in the different compartments, both by fixation of organic matter, but also by calcification, which tends to remove heavy isotopes from that internal pool. And you can sort of figure out through this model for the different species how your isotopic effect will evolve. And we've now got a very nice quantitative model that can explain these culture results of, of changing vital effects of atmospheric CO2. So this was something that was triggered by my PhD work with Harry Elderfield. So it's a, it's a nice moment to remember him. But I felt frustrated at the time of shoehorning proxies into an inorganic box. And I'm sort of really excited with this work that we finally got a way of understanding a proxy at the biological level so that we can, we can re really use it in, into the, the geological record with some, some confidence. OK, so the coccolithales have been marginalised. They've been unable to boost their carbon in their internal pool. They've stayed at a large size. And so what then is selecting Emiliani Huxley uh, uh, in the kind of modern environment? And this was something where I was a part of the UK Ocean Acidification Programme. And I was very lucky to, to work with Cecilia Balustreri, who um, took part in an enormous number of cruises, going out to different parts of the ocean where she isolated fresh uh, strains of Emiliani Huxleyi from locations up here in the Greenland Sea, uh, and also down, she was, she was part of a couple of other cruises that went down uh, to the Southern Ocean, and we, we have about uh, in fact, I've got about 30 strains, but we've only characterised about 10 of these, to try and understand the selection for the different um, properties of Emiliani Huxleyi in the modern ocean. And so what we did was we, I'm afraid, we're back, back to our KMs and our, our Vmaxes, but this time for whole cells. I was interested in the photosynthetic capacity of these cells and how they're adapting to the availability of, of carbon in the environment. And for a long time, I was really trying to figure out, can I say which of these are more efficient at concentrating carbon? And I was sort of fiddling around with all the parameters. And it was really when I just sort of took a step back and said, well, actually, what I really want to know is how they're being selected for by the carbonate chemistry of the environment. And I plotted them against the, the carbonate chemistry that we had of, uh, in the environment. And that was where I was, I guess, the, the first order result was that we could see in these freshly isolated strains was that they were being selected for by carbon in the environment. They didn't, none of the data made sense in terms of nutrients, in terms of salinity, in terms of uh, 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 phosphate, for example. But the, the, the one factor which seemed to make sense in terms of the physiology that was being selected was that it was, it was clearly matching the availability of aqueous CO2. So we measured photosynthetic, this, this photosynthetic rates. We did this for the, at the whole cell level. So essentially what we're looking for is the affinity of the cells for carbon and then their photosynthetic rate, which we measured at 2,000 uh, millimoles of, of DIC. So we, we, we did that all at the same, uh, the same value. But then we also titrated up to this Vmax to kind of work out what's the maximum photosynthetic potential of these cells. And that was where we got this really nice relationship between this kind of maximum photosynthetic potential of the cells and the aqueous CO2. And I was, I was sort of, I just, I, I'm still not sure I got a full understanding of this. As, uh, why, would, why would it be that the potential for a cell is being selected for rather than what it's actually doing in the environment? But this was really the sort of strongest uh, signal that, that, um, that we had. And I'll just show you the... The individual, the individual curves. 
And what was, what was sort of curious here, so this is the maximum O2 evolution rate, so essentially going up to the, the photosynthetic maximum against DIC. This is just in our titration, our assay in the, in the um, lab. And we have a couple of species or a couple of strains here, and these, these in fact, are, interestingly, were ones that have been in the lab for a while. Um, and they seem to totally lack any kind of CCM. But then as we went to these other strains, what was, what was interesting was that this is essentially a gradient of CO2. You're sort of selecting for these guys that are able to do a higher photosynthetic rate. And I guess what's, what suddenly struck me was that this is reminiscent of what's happening to Rubisco, that actually there's this relationship between the K half again, so low, high affinity, low affinity, and this maximum turnover rate, or the sort of flux of carbon that can go through these cells. And so at the cellular level, you've also apparently got this trade-off, so that at higher carbon dioxide, you're selecting for cells that have got a lower affinity for carbon, so they're not as good at concentrating carbon, but they can turn that carbon over much more quickly. They're able to sort of flow through that carbon. And I guess this is something I was quite surprised about. I guess I'd, I'd expected to see that they'd all have about the same P max. And there would be some which were better at concentrating carbon and they would live at low carbon levels and others would live at high carbon levels where they were less good at concentrating carbon. But it really seems to be that if you release if you release the pressure on that limiting carbon dioxide, you get these cells which can really chunk through carbon and, and turn it over quickly. And actually, when you think about it, that makes total sense with this selection for Rubisco. If you've got a Rubisco that needs a high flux rate, you've got to have a high flux rate coming through the cell to match that. And so it, it seems that both at the enzyme level and at the cellular level, you're, you're trending to this low affinity, high flux uh, uh, turnover. And interestingly, this was a result that was, was also found looking at um, both laboratory and field work experiments on the selection of, of uh, cyanobacteria. They also found this trade-off between low uh, affinity and high flux and a tendency to that under high CO2. So in case anybody is asleep at this time, I thought it was, might be time for a little movie. I suspect many of you have seen this. This is wonderful work to come out of Alison Taylor and Colin Brownlee's work. And I, everything I've told you about so far has been about photosynthesis. But of course, the question that I really want to answer is about calcification. Um, and so this is how these coccolithophores calcify. If none of you have seen this, uh, uh, then I just think it's, again, I, we, we saw something yesterday with trichodesmium eating dust, but I, I still think this is one of the most amazing things. So this is coccolithus pelagicus making its calcite totally intracellularly here. You can see this lith starting to form. It whirs around and around. It kind of fills towards the diameter of, of the cell. And then once it's completed, it pops out onto the surface in an extraordinary way. Whoop, there it goes. I tell you, the fact that they do that every hour, I've given birth a couple of times in the last five years, and I <laughs> wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Um, there we are. So, calcification. What is happening to the calcification? And, and uh, we, we've looked at this a little bit with the, these modern-day strains that we've separated from uh, uh, around the ocean. And my prediction going into this, I guess, when I, I thought about the calcification, really came out of this is Ulf Riebezel's work back in 2000, where he found that if you raise the CO2, your calcification rate to your organic carbon fixation, your photosynthesis declines with increasing CO2. So that was my, what I was expecting to find in these strains. I thought, okay, if I've got different CO2s, I'm going to see this decline in the calcification rate. I couldn't have been more wrong. Here we've measured the calcification rate and plotted it against the Pmax, and there's this incredible correlation with the calcification rate increasing in these high flux cells. So it seems to increase at the same time as the, the photosynthetic potential is increasing. So it's, it seems that the, the small cells are essentially photosy photosynthesizing slower, they're calcifying slower, and as you increase the CO2 availability, the, the whole flux through that cell increases and you can photosynthesize more and you can calcify more. How are they doing it? And uh, we've got as far as um, extracting uh, the molecules that are actually mediating the calcification in, in the coccolithophores. So this is uh, uh, the coccolith polysaccharide. This is uh, uh, old work now that was back in 1986. 
um, where we've characterized, this is the, the mediation of the calcification inside that coccolith vesicle, takes place via this polysaccharide, and the really active part of that is the uronic acid part, where you've got this carboxylate uh, ligand which can bind uh, to, to calcium and really helps the, the calcium carbonate to, to grow. This has a, a curious role because it both has to promote calcification and it also has to limit calcification so the whole cell doesn't take off, but by the by. So our prediction is that we, what we were curious to see was how does this uronic acid content of the molecules change with these different Emiliani Huxtii strains. And what we were able to find is that actually the uronic acid content, so this is looking at the amount of that carboxylic acid in the polysaccharide, correlates with our size of the internal carbon pool. So the more carbon that you've got inside the internal pool, the higher the uronic acid content, the more polar the molecule. And we were sort of trying to figure out why this was. And actually, there's beautiful work by, I never know how to say it, Geoffre and Patricia Dove, where they showed that the charge on the molecule is, um, uh, controls essentially the nucleation, the, the, the activation energy for nucleation. And the larger the charge, the harder it is to calcify, actually, in low saturated conditions. And so this makes sense, actually. If you've got a very high charge in low saturated conditions, you'll absorb water to you. You haven't got so many calciums or carbonates floating around, and you actually absorb water. And in order to calcify, you have to displace that water and bind to the calcium. So if you're calcifying in a low saturation or a smaller internal pool, then you need to have a low charge to diminish this nucleation energy. But if you get more and more carbon as you go up and increase the saturation, then it's actually beneficial to have a higher charge on that particle, particularly in higher saturation, because then you've got enough calcium and carbonate around that the out-competition is happening in the solution, and those ions then adsorb onto the uronic acid quickly. So this is, I, I thought this was really curious, and it actually gives us an insight as to the adaptation of the Emiliani Huxley to maintain a high calcification rate, both at low carbon avail availability, but also to really keep it going at very high carbon availability when you've got a higher internal carbon pool. And so this uranic acid is really, a, it, it's a way that these coccolithophores have adapted to the availability of carbon. And if I just indulge myself for a moment and go back to the coccolith ales, those really large uh, species, we've been able to extract the acidic polysaccharide from liths of that species back through a hundred million years and this is marked out in these white blobs here in the squares this is actually getting that biochemical molecule out of liths from sediments and looking at its biochemistry and we've been able to, to um, measure this uronic acid content and show that indeed as those coccolith ales have stayed large um, through time their internal pool has become less and less saturated through time as, as the environment has, has diminished in the amount of CO2. And so again, I, this is a, a, a cheeky plug for any paleo proxy people, but this is a, a, a novel alternative way, a sort of biochemical way of trying to look at CO2 in the past. Okay, so that's how we got to today and a bit about carbon dioxide selectivity in the, in the modern environment. And I guess I just have a, a last few slides as to really what's going to happen to our, our poor coccolithophores as we go into the future. And uh, again, with a, a great PhD student, Jodie Young, a few years ago, we tried to do a, an exhaustive compilation of global delta C13. I'm afraid it's coming back to isotopes. We really try and see if, can we see any evidence that, that, that the phytoplankton are already responding photosynthetically to this rise in atmospheric CO2. And we sort of predict that in terms of their organic fractionation, it should get smaller if there's been any kind of impact of increasing atmospheric CO2. And this is a, it's, it's a quite a complicated paper because we had sort of large spatial scale data set which wasn't continuous in many places at the same time. So it was, there's a few statistics and modeling in there. But uh, the, the, the sort of poster child of it was that we could see a small change in this isotopic fractionation. This was looking at POC, and this is actually the Bermuda time series. So we had both one point where we could go through a number of, of uh, years and then trying to do a compilation from elsewhere. And, and we could see some evidence that there was some 
change in the photosynthetic efficiency that was related to increased CO2 availability uh, uh, in the environment. And I guess this comes back to um, uh, sort of work that I did many years ago now with, with Paul Halloran that was, was published where we actually tried to look at the size of the coccolithophores going back over the last uh, uh, couple of centuries or so, looking at a very high accumulation rate box core from the, the North Atlantic. This stuff came up apparently and looked just like chocolate mousse. It was so, so uh, rapidly accumulating. And we found this curious evidence that it seemed like the average mass of, of the coccolithophores would increase or had increased in response to increasing CO2. And Paul sort of followed this up trying to show which species in particular um, were responding. And it seemed to be across a, a, a number of different species. Um, so I guess my, my sort of message is that at least from the modern day and looking at the evolution that actually as CO2 rises, I think there'll be a selection for the lower affinity, higher turnover species, in a sense going back to the geological record. But I guess the, the key thing is that their rubisco at the heart of the cell has changed to be a faster turnover enzyme and the cells are adapting and, and that would not have been the same in the Cretaceous or, or then you know, it's taken that time for the adaptation to occur. And so the cells are being selected to serve this, this, this um, faster turnover enzyme and to, to have a higher rate of flux of, of carbon through the cell, which serves both photosynthesis and calcification. Um, and so I'll, I'll just finish with some ac acknowledgements. So this, this has been a, a, a huge team effort from a number of fantastically talented people who are not guilty of, of saying anything wrong that I've probably said today, but have really pushed this science in uh, inventive and extraordinary ways. So Mikhail Hermoso, Mavis and Hubbard, Anna Hura, Harry McClelland, Renee Lee, Jodie Young, Ben Ray, Spencer Whitney and Rob Sharwood. And these are the guys who've been uh, uh, crazy enough to, to fund me and provide strains for many of these experiments uh, that we've performed. So uh, my conclusions are that uh, coccolithophores have really adapted photosynthetically to declining CO2 both via changing their rubisco kinetics, via diminishing in size and gaining a CCM. Um, the rubisco has changed to this lower affinity but higher turnover enzyme. Um, they've adapted calcification to evolving CO2 really through this uronic acid content of the, the cap. Um, and I really think that anthropogenically elevated CO2 will select against cells lacking a CCM, but also for those which have got a higher turnover rate, this lower affinity, higher turnover rate. And, and I, I sort of rather like this idea of the cells coming in tune with the, the changed rubisco kinetics. And so I, I may be wrong, but I think at least in the interim, the coccolithal 4 pump of carbon and calcite will speed up as, as CO2 increases in the environment. And uh, thank you for your attention.